Um, so we are um, just, I think, maybe a second away from being live on Facebook. Um, Cantor Simmons, do you want to sing for us one more time um, before we move on to our next piece to see if it is working? <laughs> Shall I keep the uh, my screen up, Rabbi Fitzler? Um, so I think we're good. So I think uh, it seems like maybe we are working. So we may have people who are starting to join us by Facebook Live. I will, after our next moment of um, participation, um, uh, I will then go back to being tech support, but um, I, we do wanna keep the prayer moving. So Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Um, the next prayer in our service is um, a prayer called Nisim B'chol Yom, um, which are the blessings for daily miracles. And um, the, uh, the blessings for daily miracles are this opportunity to uh, notice the miracles that happen every day that we might not notice otherwise. And one of the experiences for me of being home all day, all week, um, and being with my family and being with my daughter was um, in the moments where the, where the wildness of it all um, wasn't overwhelming. Um, I was able to notice that there were real blessings there, blessings that happen every day that maybe I don't always notice. And so what we want to do um, with this uh, prayer this morning is something that we sometimes do in our Saturday morning chapel service, which is we're going to um, chant the prayers together. Cantor Simmons will lead us in chanting the prayers. She'll show us the words in just a minute. Um, we'll sing half of each line in Hebrew and then half of each line in English and notice some of the traditional blessings. And then we want to invite those of you who are participating on Zoom um, to, uh, to offer, we're going to pause for a minute, and if you want to unmute your and offer your own blessing for a miracle that you've experienced today, some miracle, big or small, that you have already experienced by 1049 this morning. Um, we would love to have you share that. It's going to be an experiment. We ask for your patience to see how it goes, but we want to create the opportunity to uh, participate. And I'll try and check in with the Facebook Live uh, uh, comments to see if anybody offers any blessings there. Um, so we'll chant them, we'll pause in the middle, we'll create space for you to offer your blessings, and then we'll chant a few more blessings. So Cantor Simmons is going to show us the words now. I'm going to put myself back on mute, and we're going to chant together. <laughs> Eloheinu melech haolam, who has given the mind the ability to distinguish day from night. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, who opens the eyes of the blind. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, who frees the captive. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, who stretches the earth over the waters. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, who strengthens our steps. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, who clothes the naked. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, who gives strength to the weary. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, who removes sleep from the eyes and slumber from the eyelids. So, now so this is the moment for folks who um, want to take themselves off of mute and, uh, and we, we may have some cacophony, but if you have a blessing to share of a miracle that's happened today, we hope you'll do it, or we hope that you will uh, say something in the Facebook comments. If you don't know how to take yourself off mute and you need, I can take you off of mute, just sort of wave your arms 
if your video is on. Chat, I guess, right? I was able to find this. Okay. Do you have a blessing to share, Tori? That that's that's the blessing. Oh, that that's you were the able to do that. Happen. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. We didn't make it easy, so we're glad you're here. <laughs> one except you don't have to sing if you don't want to for having breakfast with my family and for the Nutella challah that my husband made Amen. Um, I will also offer one Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam um, this morning, my daughter wanted to play Legos with me, and I am always happy to play Legos with her, and I love that she initiated that. Amen. Anyone else in the Facebook chat, in the comments of the Zoom, or if you want to unmute yourself on Zoom, uh, want to share with us a blessing that you've experienced today? I'll give it just a few more seconds. Uh, I'll share Rabbi one. Please, Stephanie. Uh, we saw beautiful flowers on our walk this morning, and I was grateful for both the flowers and the walk. Amen. Amen. Rabbi Silk on. Oh, you muted yourself. Rabbi Silk on Facebook said, Baruch Ata Arunai Eloheinu Melech Olam, for seeing so many joining us by Zoom and Facebook. Freddie Franks on Facebook said, for lighting candles via Zoom with my kids. Um, just hearing your voices and melodies, says Sissy Boyd. And Rodney Roth said, the blessing of prayer with friends and our incredible clergy. Thanks, Rodney. Um, amen to all of those blessings. Thank you all for sharing your blessings. Keep sharing them in comments. Keep sharing them in the chat. And we're going to sing uh, just a few more of the Nisim B'chol Yom, I think, to finish us off. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, who made me in the image of God. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, who has made me free. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, who has made me a Jew. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, who girds Israel with strength. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, who crowns Israel with splendor. Amen. It is our custom after we sing our Nisim B'chol Yom to come to our moment of Torah. We are going to do some really special learning with Rabbi Hayon today. Before we do that, we're going to sing our prayer for studying Torah. Um, this setting is um, by Dan Nichols and these words, sweet as honey, that the Torah is sweet as honey. And I was thinking about that we're not going to experience our Torah scroll in person for a little while, but we can still feel its sweetness by being together and learning together. Sweet as honey, I think I'm gonna go a little higher. Sweet as honey, no, too high. Sweet as honey, sweet as honey, sweet as honey on our tongue. Sweet as honey, sweet as honey, sweet as honey on our tongue. Try that with me. Sweet as honey. Sweet as honey, sweet as honey on our tongue, our tongue. Sweet as honey, sweet as honey, sweet as honey on our tongue. Baruch atah Adonai, Share 
sweet as honey, sweet as honey, sweet as honey on our tongue. All right, everyone. Good morning. Shabbat Shalom. I'm glad we had a chance to um, start our morning with prayer and togetherness. We're going to move into a, a little bit of study now, having offered the prayer for uh, the study of holy text. We're going to do a little bit of uh, looking together at um, a couple of sections from the Torah portion this week um, and explore a little bit about um, what they might mean to us at this particular unique time in, in history and in our community. We're going to, I'm going to be doing some experimenting with kind of opening up our conversation here on Zoom so that people can chime in um, either in the chat um, or by unmuting your mic. Um, we'll do our best. You can, um, there is a chat uh, function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, which you can pop up and have as a sidebar if you want to have a conversation there. Um, and as Rabbi Fixler said earlier, you can either sort of wave your hand um, if you want to be recognized and have something to contribute so that it's not just me and talking the whole time. I'm also in the chat box right now, um, giving you a link uh, to the source sheet that we're going to be studying from this morning. I'm going to have it up on the screen, but if you'd like to look at the source sheet yourself later um, or have it um, up on another screen while we're learning, if that's easier for you and more comfortable for your learning, uh, the link to the source sheet is now up in the chat. So um, what we're going to do this morning is take a look first at, um, let's see if we can get here. We're going to take a look at this short source sheet right here, and here we go, I think. There we are. So we're going to take a look um, at the very uh, a section close to the um, beginning of the 36th chapter of Exodus. Um, we're very close to the end of the book. We finished reading the book of Exodus this week. Uh, and as part of the final preparations and commandments at the end of the book of Exodus, God is giving Moses instructions um, to direct the people about how they should finish the uh, the decorations and the accessories for the Mishkan, for the portable desert sanctuary where the people are going to be making offerings to God. Uh, and they're filling the tabernacle with all sorts of um, art and fabric and precious metals, um, gold appliances for the priests to do their work on. Um, and the section that we're going to look at this morning is this section, uh, this line, Exodus 36.8. One of the instructions that Moses gives to the artisans that are going to be decorating the Mishkan is as follows. Um, then all the skilled among those engaged in the work made the tabernacle of 10 strips of cloth, oops, which they made of fine twisted linen, blue, purple, and crimson yarns. Into these they worked a design of cherubim, of kruvim in Hebrew. So we need to do a little bit of exploring about what these kruvim, what these cherubim are. If you think about um, what, what we think that word means in, uh, in English, when we talk about someone having a cherubic look or a cherubic feature, we think about the way that they show up a lot of times in art. So we're going to look at a couple of pictures of cherubs. You see, they, we usually think about them looking something like this, kind of big, fat, adorable babies with wings uh, that float around in the sky. They have really cute faces. They're super adorable. That's kind of what the, what the word has come to mean in English. So I'm going to give you a couple more. Here's another little cherub. Look how cute she is where we talk about someone having a cherubic mouth or cherubic eyes. So that's, you know, it's very cute, angelic looking, um, cute baby faced angels with wings. There's this familiar, very famous piece of art of these two pondering cherubs thinking about the world, thinking about what they're going to have for lunch. I'm not sure what they're thinking about. But you can see that's what the cherubs um, tend to look like. But if we, if, we, uh, if we look a little bit deeper about um, what the Kruvim are in Hebrew, the way that they appear in the Bible, um, they do show up at another point in the Bible story, and they don't, their character doesn't seem to be um, this sort of angelic, innocent, kind, and adorable um, perspective. So we see the cherubs show up again for the first time, actually. We're going to go back a little bit here. The cherubs show up for the first time at the end of the third chapter of Genesis. Let's set a little bit of um, context here. So this is after Adam and Eve have disobeyed God and eaten from the tree of knowledge. And um, God decides that Adam and Eve need to be punished. And so they are sent out of the garden. So the eternal God, this is uh, Genesis 3:23. So the eternal God banished Adam from the garden of Eden to till the soil from which he was taken. God drove the man out and stationed east of the garden of Eden, the Kruvim, the Cherubim, there they are, and the fiery ever-turning sword to guard the way to the tree of life. 
So um, I'm going to try to see if I can make this work now. I'm going to try to unmute everybody if I can make this work. Um, let's, um, uh, let's see if I can make this work. How would you describe the, the character of the cherubim that are being used to, to guard the garden? Uh, if we're not thinking that they are. Um, OK, I'm sure he'd be. Someone? Oh. Um, anyone would like to unmute themselves? How would you describe the character of these cherubim that are guarding the garden? Imposing. I heard Liz say imposing, I think. Imposing, I like that, that's good. Thank you, sorry, I'm having trouble with the, uh, the controls here, but. Um, I think most folks are unmuted, but just be careful because then if you've got background sound, um, we will be able to hear it. Yeah, I like I like imposing. I mean, I think the, you know, the, the role of these cherubim obviously are meant to be maybe a little bit frightening. Um, they're sort of the, they're, you know, they become kind of the bouncer, the bodyguards of the of the Garden of Eden, trying to keep out people that aren't authorized to be in there. Um, and by the way, also let's remember they're they're holding swords. That's pretty different than this image we had of these cute little angels up here a few minutes ago, um, who are just being adorable and don't, you know, have any um, any sinister motives at all. The the angels, the Kruvim in the Garden of Eden, are meant to be pretty frightening, I think. So. So we're going to take a look. Where it's going. So one thing that we um, that we have from the benefit of um, archaeology is that we can go back and look at some of the art, um, very different from this Renaissance kind of art, to go back into the art of the ancient world and see the way that Kuruvim, that Cherubim, were um, depicted in other kinds of ancient Near Eastern art. So we have a couple of things that have been excavated from uh, Babylonia, from Assyria, uh, from ancient Persia. I'm gonna look at, let you look at a couple of these as well. And you'll see these are cherubim, the way that they were depicted in the ancient world, very different from the cute, angelic, innocent babies with wings. So this is, uh, this is a Babylonian cherub. You can see um, that it's got the head of a person and the body of what looks like a, either a horse or an ox. It's got, uh, you can see that it's got hooves a big beard and a human face. And up here at the top, you can see that this, um, that this cherub does have wings. It's pretty scary looking. That's more of a bodyguard than the fat babies with wings. Here's another one. This I think is an Assyrian one. Um, so this also has an animal body. It looks like those are, um, those might be lion's feet or legs. You can see those are a little different. They don't have hooves. They have some kind of, um, some kind of animals uh, with claws and toes, but again, wings, a human face, not very welcoming or accommodating. Here's another one that's kind of similar, also uh, either a, a giant, a big cat body, um, a person's face, it looks like maybe two sets of eyes, a pair of wings, a human head. And here's our last one, I think. Here's our last one. This is another one. This is a uh, this is a relief, a bas relief that is uh, excavated from northern Syria, I believe. Um, this one has again maybe a lion body. You can see the lion's tail there and feet. A pair of wings, and this one actually seems to have two heads, right? A, a, a like an animal head down here. Maybe that's the great cat, and then a human head up on the top. So not. Friendly, warm and fuzzy, not Hallmark card cherubim. These are pretty scary. And um, as I think the cantor pointed out, they all have some very similar characteristics. Animal bodies, a pair of bird wings, and then a human head. Really, really interesting. So <clears throat> what's interesting is that um, this, the personality of the cherub encompasses sort of both of his impulses. One, um, the desire to push away but we, but they're placed on the on the mishkan, on the on the tabernacle, the place of gathering. So ironically, these animals that are the symbol of exile, of pushing away, are placed on the tabernacle, which is uh, the result of 
Moses is gathering the people. We're going to take a look right here. Exodus 35. This is the very beginning of our Parsha. Vayakhel Moshe. That's the name of our Parsha. Vayakhel, which means Moses then gathered together. It's a little bit strange that in a whole portion that's all about gathering the people together, welcoming in, embracing the entire community into this place of, uh, of worship and faith, is symbolized by these animals, these mythic creatures that were designed to keep people out, to keep people away. So um, we're going to keep looking. So Moses then gathered the whole Israelite community and said to them, these are the things that God has commanded you to do. Here we go. We're going to keep going down. We get more about the cherubim elsewhere in the book of Exodus. And now we're going to get a little more detail about maybe why they were there and what their function is. Exodus 37 talks to us about the construction about the, of the lid that goes on top of the Ark of the Covenant, where the tablets, the broken tablets uh, that uh, Moses broke on Mount Sinai and the full tablets that contain the Ten Commandments were stored. So inside the, the Ark, which is a kind of gold box that keeps the Ark, the, the tablets inside them, this is a description of the, of the lid that's placed on top of the Ark. The artisan made a cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. He made two cherubim of gold. There they are again. He made them out of hammered work at the two ends of the cover, one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. He made the cherub of one piece with the cover at its two ends. The cherubim had their wings spread out above, shielding the cover with their wings. They faced each other. The faces of the cherubim were turned toward the cover. So now for some who asked about, is there a description about what cherubim looked like in the Bible? This helps us a little bit. This tells us that the, the ancient Israelites in their idea of what a cherub looked like, we know that they had wings. We know that they had faces. We don't know much about their bodies. We don't know about the size or the shape or anything about that, except that they were some kind of mythic creature that could be scary um, and that had wings. So we're going to look at a little bit more art to see what the cherubim on the ark might have looked like. Remember those animals we saw with the lion bodies and the great big wings and the human faces? Uh, these are some sort of modern ideas about what the lid of the Ark of the Covenant might have looked like. So there, you Rabbi Hayon, there were two comments in the chat um, sure. that I wanted to call your attention to. One from Tori that uh, wondered if they had human faces as a calming feature for humans, um, so they sort, of, sort of familiarity. Um, and then Liz uh, made a comment about like uh, not well. I'm a, a llama. She said I never thought to equate the llama of Assyria to the cherubim, but it makes sense in the context of Ezekiel's vision. Yeah, we also have you know the other thing that we have is. Um, there is, I, I apologize for not having the, the words and the text, but there is a, there are, um, the bridge, I think, between the Assyrian images and the, the ancient Israelite one is that we have some material in Egyptian. <clears throat> I'll have to dig it up and find it for you. Dig it up as an archaeology joke. I'll have to find it uh, and share with you, but there, there seems to be a link between all of these mythic creatures in the ancient world. So um, let's keep going. These are, again, I have to emphasize what we're going to look at now are some modern ideas of what this might have looked like. Some kind of animals with wings facing each other on the lid of the ark. Okay, there is a sort of animated version of what this might have looked like. This is a very fancy household ark of the covenant. You can see the two creatures on top with their wings outstretched and facing each other. And this last one here I'm very happy about. This is a nine and a half inch replica ark of the covenant that is available now on Amazon. So uh, if you feel like you want something on your coffee table that looks like the Ark of the Covenant, there it is. Um, you can see here, these are much, these, these uh, cherubim on top of this little replica look more, much more like people. Um, this manufacturer has made them look like sort of praying people with wings facing each other. I did not buy one of these, but it's on my list. It's in my shopping cart. So now we're going to sort of try, we can bundle all this stuff together. So we've got the image of the cherubim on the tapestry the image of the, the cherubim from the Garden of Eden keeping out Adam and Eve, an image of the cherubim that are crafted out of gold on top of the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. So here we go. Let's, let's look back in Exodus to try to bundle all this stuff together. There, this is God speaking, there I will meet with you, you Moses, and I will impart to you from above the cover from between the two cherubim that are on top of the Ark of the Covenant, all that I will command you concerning the Israelite people. More detail from the book of Numbers. When Moses went into the tent of meeting to speak with God, he would hear God's voice addressing him from above the cover that was on top of the Ark of the Covenant, between the two cherubim. Thus God spoke to him. So the, the Torah tells us in more detail that it's this space, 
sort of right, this sort of empty space in between the space, the empty space made by the, the wings of the cherubim. That's the space from which God's voice emanates. So what's really interesting is that um, in the context of a Parsha that's called Vayach Hale, about the gathering together of the people, that God's presence emanates from the space that is created within a gathering of faces. So we're going to go even a little bit farther down to make it put an even finer point on this. We just looked at this. So when the, the Bible talks about God's voice emanating from between the faces of the cherubim, just to put to make this even more explicit, the cherubim had their wings spread out above, shielding the cover with their wings. They faced each other. We read that earlier in English, but I want to look at the Hebrew also. When it talks about the space from which God's voice emanated, Upnehem ish el echav. So the literal translation of this Hebrew is that God's voice comes from out of a space where one face is presented to its brother. I don't know how best to translate that. From uh, from the space between one face and its brothers, between one face and its siblings. That's the space from which God's voice emanates. So I think the point now becomes fairly evident that the the image of the cherubim which are neither fat, adorable, angelic babies, nor are they just scary, mean, imposing, sword-wielding bodyguards, but they represent a, a real presence which creates a space from which God's presence can emerge. So look, we're, we're at a time now when presence and nearness and community is, is evolving in real time. Our, 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 the, the space and the time that we share together um, is moved into a virtual space and out of concrete space. Um, but what I think the Parsha comes to tell us is that uh, in this dynamic of drawing close and pushing away, of welcoming and gathering and bodyguarding and keeping out, in this sort of dynamic, this pushing, pulling dynamic, we create a space, we create a hollow vacuum within the circle of our company and our presences. And it's in that space that we feel the presence of, of what is holy. So we can't sort of turn our back from each other, even though the circumstances in the world uh, invite us and encourage us to be distant from each other. Even though we're physically distant, we still have to maintain a, a kind of community and nearness and oneness so that in that space, we can detect something that is holy. I think it's not an accident that the Torah talks about this image of the two cherubim on the ark facing each other as, a, as an image of siblings being opposite each other. That um, our job is to make sure that we see each other as brothers and sisters, as siblings, um, even though we can't bridge completely the gap that separates us. We have to maintain that empty space, both now for public health reasons, but also to make room for what will fill it. Um, holiness, obligation, connectedness, um, and divinity. I'm gonna turn to the chat now Yes, so Liz, you're exactly right. This is, um, there, there are, it does look a lot like the, the, uh, the Ark from Raiders of the Lost Ark. If you're looking for something to stream while you're stuck at home, that's a great choice. Um, there is a, yes, Cantor Allen, you're right. There is a, there's a holiness in the space that we keep between us that, you know, we might be tempted to think that because we can't hug each other and cuddle with each other all the time, that that uh, eliminates the opportunity for connection. But I think the Parsha reminds us that, that, uh, even or especially in a little bit of holy space, we can cultivate something transcendent and very special. So um, I, I want to I want to leave you with that thought to think about the ways that the space between us can be a, a sort of an incubator for what is holy, to be an incubator for community and love and obligation to each other. Um, that even when we are distant from each other, to not stop thinking about people in our community as being related to us, as being connected to us, and being obligated to us. Um, to try to fill this with something that can make sense and that we can then go back and lean on and feel embraced by even when um, we're allowed to get physically closer to one another. So I want to wish all of you all a, uh, a Shabbat Shalom. Thanks for sharing a little bit of time with me and a little bit of learning this morning. Uh, and I'm going to hand it back over to Rabbi Silk. Thank you. So I'm thinking about that space, and I think we're more aware of those spaces than we've ever been, um, because we're being told to keep those physical spaces. Um, but if in that space is where the divine voice comes from, 
we know that we can summon that voice in our spaces and continue to pray for those who are sick and in need of healing. Every Shabbat, we pray our Mishaberach prayer, asking God, who's been a source and strength of healing for the generations of our people, to continue to be that source for us, um, to continue to be the one who blesses, who brings about healing. And um, certainly this prayer is something we can continue to pray and we do more fervently than ever for those who are afflicted with the virus, for those who are fearful, for those who are wrapped in anxiety and concern, um, for those still suffering from other ailments and um, diseases, those, anyone who is suffering that this prayer now, our Misha Beirach prayer is one that we hold close to in these spaces and send out. And as I like to say often in Shabbat and Shabbat morning in the chapel, um, when you pray for somebody, it can be powerful to let them know you're praying for them. So for friends and family who you know are not well, um, maybe we can't see them now physically in front of our faces the same way we're accustomed to, um, we can text or call or send an email or a letter and let them know that we are praying for them and that we do so as part of this larger community. And so I invite you to think of somebody that needs healing. I think there's great power in saying those things out loud. Um, if you wanna unmute and share a name, you can, or stay muted and just say it. I feel that God hears our prayers even when we're muted on Zoom um, and that we, we can bring sort of the names of those who are in need of healing including our worldwide community, right? All those who are, who are suffering and, and who are afraid and who are needing more shalem, more wholeness on this Shabbat. Mm -hmm. We sing together our prayer of healing Mishabera. May the source of strength who bless the ones before us help us find the courage to make our lives a blessing and let us say Amen. Holding in our hearts uh, people in our lives who are in need of healing, one of the other ways that we might turn to our tradition for strength in these moments is in, in moments of memory. And in recalling the people who shaped our lives, the people whose presence um, have been a force of strength and support in our lives in the past, and calling on those memories may be a way for us to find strength and support also in the present. We know that there are folks who, even though we are in social isolation, are wanting to observe periods of mourning, um, who are in the recent days after a death, who are in uh, the period of Shloshim, of the 30 days after death, or who maybe are in um, observing a yard site. And we want to uh, give an opportunity for folks who would like to say Kaddish in virtual community to do so. Um, if there is someone who 
you are recalling on this Shabbat, I want to invite you please to share those names. Again, you can say it on mute, you can take yourself off mute and say it, you can say it in the chat or you can say it in the Facebook uh, comments, but I'm gonna give you just a moment. Uh, we are recalling as a community, Lex Jonathan Ricklin, who was laid to rest in recent days. Um, if there are others that you are calling, we'll give you just a moment. Dave. Uh, passed away a week ago. Um, there are a few names in the chat, Henry Liebman and Rachel Levine or Levine, I don't know. I'm going to give you the opportunity to, uh, if, uh, to rise if you want to in the space where you are. Um, as we turn to these ancient words for memory. Yit kadal v'yit kadash shemei rabah, ba'alma divrach v'yutei v'yalmich malchutei, v'chayechon v'yomechon v'chayei d'chol b'yit Yisrael, ba'agala v'yizman kari v'imru amen. V'hei shemei rabah mevorach le'olam o'me amaya, Eat Barach, Vish Bach, Vit Bar, Vit Homam, Vit Nase, Vit Hadar, Vitale, Vitalal, Shmed Kutcha, Brihu, Laela Min Kol Birchata, Vashirata, Tushbechata, Venechemata, Dami Rambe Ama, Vimru Ame, Ehe Shlama Rabba Min Shmaya, Vehaim Alenu Vel Kol Yisrael, Vimru Ame, O Se Shalom Bim Romav, Huya Ase Shalom. Alinu ve'al kol Yisrael v'imru amen. O se shalom v'imru ma huya se shalom aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael v'imru amen. Kendra Simmons, I think you are on mute. Oh, whoops. We are going to sing uh, Vashamru to celebrate Shabbat um, together. It's been so special to to share this this morning together on Shabbat. Vashamru. So we now uh, raise our Kiddush cups, if you have one nearby. 
and we bless together. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Borei Peri Hagafen Lechayim. Maybe Rabbi Hayon, you wanna? Close us out. Um, I want to. I want to jump in and thank people for participating. Rabbi Hayon will get the last word, but um, I want to also say, if you're watching on Facebook or you're watching on Zoom and you have feedback, we are we are trying to figure out how best to engage folks, how best to make this meaningful, how best to um, to create opportunities for engagement and presence and. Uh, across multiple platforms and multiple streams. We apologize for our technical difficulties at the beginning of this service um, and hope that we'll be able to post the full video later. Um, but we are uh, eager to hear from you about what's working and what could work better so that we can make these optimally meaningful, knowing that there are lots of different people in lots of different places with lots of different needs, spiritual and otherwise in this moment. So please be in touch with us about that. And uh, Rabbi Hayon, I'm sure we'll have things to say about being in touch with us and all sorts of, for all sorts of other needs. Right, exactly. Thank you, Rabbi Fixon. Thank you all for being with us. Shabbat Shalom. It is, it's really nice to be with you, um, to see your faces, to hear your voices, to see your remarks in the chat. Um, it makes me feel a little bit less alone. I hope it accomplished that for the, all of you as well, to just know that there are other voices, other hearts, and other souls out there that are um, yearning to connect, um, to learn, and to feel seen and heard. Um, it just it reminds me of those kind of most primal and important needs that we have and the most vital things that a uh, sacred community can accomplish to make us remember that there are things that are bigger than ourselves, that there are communities larger than ourselves, um, and that there are things that we can accomplish um, together even when we're not physically together. Um, so I want to encourage you this Shabbat and the rest of this week to, to continue offering your presence, um, the gifts of your heart that I talked about last night at Shabbat, the gifts of your heart uh, and your hands when, um, when applicable to help lighten other people's burdens um, to make sure that we can really be here for each other. Um, this may be quite a while that Shabbat looks and feels different than it used to. Um, so we have to be prepared to, to really reposition ourselves in the way that we encounter each other as Jews and as, as community members to take care of each other, uh, to speak up when we're feeling alone or feeling like we need a little bit of help. Um, please do reach out to any members of the clergy. If you could just use a chat, a phone call, um, the delivery of a little bit of chicken soup, let us know. We would love to be here for you, even if we can't be here with you. Um, know that all of you are in our thoughts. You remain in our prayers uh, and in our hearts. I hope it's a, a restful and restorative Shabbat. I'll look forward to seeing you um, online and around town. Uh, Shabbat Shalom. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. So those of you who are still on Zoom, you will get um, booted off momentarily. Thanks for being with us. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.